bonjour, good morning. Um, I apologize in advance, but neither myself or Charles um, speak any French, so um, I hope there are enough of you in the audience that, um, that understand us. Um, but during the question and answer session, I know um, we've been very kindly offered um, a translation. So if this makes no sense to you, then there will be the opportunity to engage with Charles and um, hopefully um, bring the collection to life. So um, thank you very much for having us here today. And we're very excited to be able to, can you hear me? To be able to introduce to you the Brooking National Architectural Museum. Uh, which is a collection of rescued architectural elements uh, from um, a wide range of sources, from large country houses to um, the, you know, the, the small terrace house. Um, Charles has been collecting. Charles um, has established a collection of over half a million items um, from windows, doors, staircases, ironmongery, fire grates, rainwater heads, um, you name it, the collection probably has an example of um, the, the architectural element in question. Um, like I said before, it ranges from um, high-end um, pieces from places such as Wembley Stadium and Downing Street, um, as, as well as items from you know, the more humble home. So who is Charles Brooking? Um, well, apart from sitting right here in the front row, um, he has been collecting really since he was three years old um, when he became fascinated with Bakelite numbers. And um, the, this fasc fascination with the shapes and the forms that um, occur within, the, within architecture um, became a lifelong um, passion and over the years he started to um, collect and rescue elements that were otherwise going to be lost. Um, in the early days he was helped by his mother sort of persuading people on site to donate the items either offering them a you know a bottle of vodka or whiskey or a packet of cigarettes or something to uh, to say thank you for their assistance um, and Charles today can often be found um, climbing in skips of places in order to be able to rescue um, items that, like I said, otherwise would just be lost. Uh, so um, currently the collection um, is located at Charles's home, which is based in Cranley in Surrey, um, just outside of London. Uh, for many years it was actually housed at the Greenwich um, University where they used it as a teaching collection. Um, unfortunately, the university changed its um, direction from modern architecture, sorry, from traditional architecture to modern architecture, and unfortunately, they no longer required the collection to use as a teaching resource. Uh, so about five years ago, um, the collection was moved. The pre predominantly, it's now in storage, but Charles does have a teaching collection on site um, where we are visited from people like Historic England, um, conservation officers, um, architects, um, and so on. Because the really unique thing about the collection is because they are the items rather than the, the finished product, people can handle these pieces, they can see cross sections, and they can really understand how the pieces are constructed um, while seeing the evolution of these items and how things have evolved over time. Uh, a charity was set up um, over the last couple of years in order to take over the management of the collection and we are now, that's where I come in, um, so I help out with the charity side of things and we are now in a process of developing the collection, um, working with, um, with funding streams etc in order to hopefully find it a, a permanent home um, and to make sure the collection is secured um, long term for future generations. Uh, I just said that bit. Um, so, like, I'll just finish out with saying this is a, a really legendary sort of archive of of items. Um, it's incredibly unique. Charles has a phenomenal memory. Um, he can probably talk about every single item in the collection just off the top of his head. 
Um, so it's very, very hard to constrain him down to a, a few items. Um, we have, however, brought along um, a couple of items. They're on the table at the front here. During the breaks, please feel free to have a look at them, pick them up, um, ask any, any questions. Um, and certainly, if you're interested in visiting the collection, if you're ever over um, in, in England in that part of the woods, please do um, let us know. We have leaflets, contact details, um, so please do get in touch. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Charles. He's going to talk about six particular items that he's brought with him. Um, and like I said, there will be the opportunity during the question and the answer session to have some translation. So, um, thank you very much. My pleasure. Over to you, Charles. Yes, sorry, I can't speak French, but I've just brought a, probably about 20 items across. So, um, I'm rescuing all the time. I've literally this week rescued about 20 English windows that are being lost. I mean, the loss and destruction in the UK with PVC is incredible. And I noticed on the train coming here, the PVC replacing windows is appalling. I mean, we're losing all the original joinery. And it's wonderful to come here and see the display outside of um, French and Belgian window joinery. I brought a window back in Rome on the train. I went to Rome um, 20 years ago and managed to find a, a, a casement window on the pavement and retrieved it and brought it back on the train for the museum. So I'm trying to cover the history of the window in detail. This piece here is a staircase um, carved tread in from German Street um, in London um, about 1740. I've stripped the paint to show the construction and I do this all the time, the lead paint. There's about 50 coats of paint on this and I do it so it can be used for teaching purposes so you get an idea. We've got about, I suppose, about 100 staircase sections in the collection about six foot of the staircase to show the construction and I go on site with a saw and literally cut them out when the building's being demolished and I go to recycling centres and pick things up. I mean it's immense, the amount of rebuilding now in the UK is phenomenal. But it's marvellous to see this place, place here and this wonderful conservation centre. Um, the next piece I brought along, I was going to bring more but space and weight of them. This came from 80, um, 61 Harley Street in London, and it's a hand-carved architrave um, from the ground floor with carved enrichment. Um, you can see the paint build up. This was being skipped earlier this year. Um, they were refurbishing the house, and this wonderful detail was being stripped out. But I've got about 5,000, 8,000 architraves, skirting, and dado sections, mouldings from round windows and doors showing the profile, so you can see the profile, the construction of all these pieces, and they're used by architects and they're drawn students. We run CPDs and we teach, and also I've got a company copying these mouldings, and they've been re reproduced at Key in, in the UK, copy these mouldings, and they're actually supplied to people restoring buildings. And every time I go in a building, I have my saw and I cut a section about this section um, to show the construction. I, my collection starts in around 1590, but I'm now taking the story up to about 1975, and I've got pieces by Richard Rogers, Staircase Sections, Owen Lewd, and other people, so it goes on, and I've even got one or two PVC windows, early ones from Greenwich Hospital, which may have been made in Belgium in 1965 with wooden cores, which is quite interesting. This piece is a wrought iron hinge from David Garrick's villa in Hampton, Middlesex, designed by Robert Adam. It's got the hand-cut 18th century screws, they're hand-cut, and it's blacksmith made from a window shutter, internal window shutter. We've got several, I suppose about 10 or 12,000 items of ironmongery ranging from the 16th century up to the present day and they're all recorded, but this is a good example of a typical English um, hinge. It's, they don't lift off like they do over here, they're made in one piece, whereas in Europe they're made to lift off, and you've got the two-part hinge, and this is a typical English version. I think yours is more sensible, because you can lift it off, lift the doors off, but in, in England they tend to be in one piece. Later on they were made in cast iron, but wrought iron was 
that continued up to about 1790 and later in some cases, but cast iron appeared in the UK in the 1780s, 1790s, the cast iron butt hinge, and there are many types of hinges. Um, I'll continue because I've got quite a few to go through. This is a, a sash window glazing bar, something like yours with an ovolo moulding. This came from Northamptonshire from a vertically sliding sash window, and this moulding was used over here as well with variation. This ovlo moulding was the most common. Glazing bars became thinner as the century progressed, and by the 1780s they were about that thick, but it gives you an idea of the mouldings and the joints. Um, that's, that's dowelled, and I'm rescuing windows all the time because they're disappearing at such a rate it's frightening with PVC and double glazing. So it's the only museum apparently in the UK doing it. And the same with doors and all these other subjects. So I've got to get this lot catalogued and it's a huge task. Um, but we've now obviously got help and enthusiasm. This shows the um, level of decay over the period. It's decayed, but the lead paint has preserved the timber. It was lead painted internally and externally white. And this is a horizontal member, and you can see the construction. Um, notice the, the um, scribing there. There are some examples outside of um, Belgian windows like this. Um, this is something very important. You can date sash windows by the sash pulleys. I've got over 30,000 of the different types of sash pulley, ranging from the I suppose the 17, well, the earliest 1690s, right up to the present day. This example was made in about 1900 with a, a sash chain rather than the cord. I'm not sure if you have these windows over here occasionally or not, but they developed in France, the sliding window, and we had the idea of actually counterbalancing them in the late 17th century. And it's interesting comparing the two different types of technology. The, the continental casement and the sliding sash in, Euro in the UK. This is a wrought iron hook to support the um, weight, the, the large weight underneath, made by Rhodes of London, um, and it's one of the better quality types. This is an English, an English sash window section. From um, This came from Darlington, about 1865 from a public house, the Pied Piper, and it shows typical um, English sash windows with the weights, the way they're constructed with the weight box and the sashes that slide. In Europe, you had sliding sashes in the 17th century, but they didn't have the weights. So this box was made up, and there are two cast iron weights that go in there. And you can see it's quite a complex construction um, with um, an in, a, a staff bead, um, parting bead, headpiece, outside lining, inside lining, architrave, and the sash here is a separate entity. Entity That's the pulley style, inside lining, outside lining, back lining, and the architrave. Um, this was originally polished, so the sash moved up and down, but later it was painted. This is lead paint, which of course can cause problems, but it's good to preserve it because it preserves the timber. Well, the reason for this collection, I do it because I'm passionate about the, the objects. I love them, and I've been fascinated for the last 60 years now, is to preserve a record for people like you to understand the joinery and what's being lost and make a record of all these things before they disappear, but also to help with restoration. This came from a restoration project in Guildford um, from Aubrey Mill, and it's 1780. It shows how thin the glazing bars have become. This is... 1725 and that's 1780 and you can see how thin it's become this was res preserved restored and then a net new owner bought it and took it out and put pvc in and this was trashed it had original glass and everything baltic pine nothing wrong with it but this is what's happening that's a an ovlo molding and this is an astrical and hollow molding which you do have in this country on your windows apparently and in france variations of this molding and they were made by hand Machine moulding came in in the 1810s, 1820s, steam joinery in the UK, and you get joinery works mass-producing things. But your casement manufacturer is fascinating because you've got the all the weathering for remote opening casements, which is quite different. 
this is oak, which was used in the 18th century, whereas this is Baltic pine, which superseded oak um, because oak was too expensive. But Baltic pine was incredibly... Um, it lasted, was very strong and lasted incredibly well because it was actually painted with lead paint externally. This is a drop handle um, lock, a small lock. Um, this came from um, a house near, um, let me see, it was in Sussex. That's about 17, um, 90, 18, 25. And we've got about five or 600 locks and fittings. But this is a typical 18th century detail in the UK, the drop handle with the spring. You can look at these. If you want to pass them round, you can, but um, we can. We want to produce books on the subject, publications on windows, doors, fire grate staircases, but particularly joinery and dating methods, and that's something we're working on, a whole series of books. I've built this up and haven't really been had the time to write never, but actually want to start writing on the subject. It's a huge um, thing to do. Um, but to give you an idea, these sash pulleys alone will take several books because this one is about 1760 from Bowwood House, and the early ones were brass with wrought iron base backs. And these are useful for dating sash winners. That's why I've paid so much attention to them. Um, this is cast brass with wrought iron, wrought iron back. Um, the later ones get very elaborate types, incredibly elaborate with roller bearing to, um, compensating wheels to take the weight of the sash with aluminium face plates made by Gibbons of Wolverhampton. And you can actually pin down the date of a window with these fittings. And every time I go to a demolition, I, come, I take one of these out if they've got sash windows because they're so useful in dating. And in the last week, I found several new varieties. Today, they're made of plastic. And to give you an idea, this is the modern version, <laughs> nylon plastic, pretty horrible. And this is a type made for the American market with a decorative faceplate. So it's actually decorated. This Americans liked um, fancy cast iron, so you've got this decorative faceplate. This is about 1890, 1925. And um, we, undertake, we undertake consultancy work on site, and I'm regularly on site um, going around looking at historic buildings, unpicking the history of windows, um, joinery, mouldings. I'm doing about seven next month all over London and the UK. And I've covered the whole of the UK in the collection, um, the Channel Islands, um, Ireland, um, and of course Scotland and Wales. And I have got some French windows in the collection. I want to gather some more to compare the joinery details and some French ironmongery. This is a doorknob of the type used on the Queen Mary in 1936, Bakelite, green, a typical 1930s doorknob. Um, and it's made by um, Cromwell's, um, very advanced for its date, quite colourful, because Bakelite was usually brown, but colours came in in the mid-30s, and the, on the Queen Mary there were cream. Uh, so it's quite a nice example. We've got, again, several hundred door fittings and knobs, ranging from the earliest Hampton Court Palace, about 1675 from Hampton Court Palace, Hinge, cocked, cock's head hinge from the Guildford area, and that's about 1620 to 50, wrought iron, blacksmith made, um, used on cupboards, doors, and um, quite important. When I found that it was covered in paint, originally it would have been exposed, but one of the many details that are being lost, held in, in place with wrought iron nails, this is what we want to you know, really illustrate in the book, the use of hand-cut screws, nails, um, me fixing methods, uh, all these things that are so important to really understand building's evolution. Sorry, we don't have the photographs of these, but you can look at them. This is a casement handle, um, 1905, made by Henry Hope of Birmingham arts and crafts from a house um, near Guildford. And these are being ripped out in their thousands, steel windows now and replaced with BVC. But the quality of that 
um, is amazing. I'm not sure if you have metal windows over here in factories and industrial buildings, but in the UK we're, we're still using them, but they're being replaced and lost. And um, it's a tragedy, really, because all this craftsmanship is lost. The name of the maker is on, on the actual fitting here, on the handle, Henry Hope of Birmingham. They made the windows for the Palace of Westminster in 18. 54, 50, 58, and of course were founded in 1818 and were taken over by Crittles in 1966. But there's still a Hopes window manufactory in America. So you can see the design is pure arts and crafts, blacksmith made, but all this was factory made. And we're continuing to collect, and obviously we're looking for volunteers, cataloguers. Anna's been very patient with me because I've been so busy collecting. I've got to get down to some cataloging, and I had a good stern um, lecture last night about cataloging. <laughs> it's important to get it done, because I'm 63 now, so I've got to ca catalogue half a million items in the next 30 years. So it's a, it's a huge undertaking. Well, I hope that gives you an idea. I mean, you can look at these pieces. I was going to bring another 20 or 30, but the case got a bit heavy. So um, there, it's a cross-section. Um, sash fastener from Guildford um, or Cranley that was removed last week from one of the windows, chi white china, made about 1885 by W. Tonkson's son. The window was replaced and I was there to rescue it. Um, I've also got the catalogues, the books, all the original trade catalogues showing these fittings um, from the 1870s onwards. So it's backed up with um, paperwork and everything's photographed in situ all the buildings are photographed I've got thousands of photographs of all the sites so when I go on site I photograph and then I take the things out and they're catalogued so every time I get called I've been called to a site in um, Hereford to look at a 1910 house in two weeks time and I'm going to remove um, Art Nouveau windows and features and um, and so on. It, it goes on, the, the work, and it's balancing that with the cataloguing and um, getting it all done. It's, we need a team, really, but it's important, and it's good to see the collections here and what you've got on display in terms of window joinery and craftsmanship. We need something like this, a centre like this for the collection and, and for teaching in the UK. So um, do have a look at these afterwards. Um, you can look at them in detail, photograph them. In fact, I'm going to leave this piece here if they're interested for your collection, because I've got more of this. So this will be on display here if they would like it, this section of carved architrave, so they can have this. These two pieces I will leave for the center. This, this, so you can actually, these will be on permanent display on long-term loan from the trust because they're, they're English and they just show the technology and carving. These were carved by specialist carvers who specialised in staircases, and they were paid, on, in the architrave situation, they were paid so much a foot when they did the carving. So all this was done by hand. This is in two sections. That's one section. There's a division there. So it's made up and glued together with Scotch glue. All made by hand, the whole thing. Well, I hope that gives you an idea of what it's about and you're welcome to visit. It's open by appointment, and we've got a teaching collection in Cranley and a huge barn, much bigger than this space, full of items and five con or six containers, 20-foot containers full of items from Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle, all over the UK, um, doors from 10 Downing Street, right down to cottages in Scotland and Guernsey, the Isle of Man, and two French windows, one from a chateau near Normandy, about 1670, 1680, with cylinder glass and the espanolette bolts. So we're building up. And also a window from um, Normandy, 1913, shows the um, cylinder glass and the mouldings and the joints you use for the casements, close inward opening casements. Is that... I, that's... Thank you very much.